you are a junior. Okay. Let's try a liver because that next in our group. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Church. Today we have gathered in the Lord's name to worship Him. Well, I'm sure we have a lot of things on our mind when we come into the room, 
but our job right now is to set those things aside and to focus our hearts and our attention on the Lord who we've gathered to worship. So I'd like to invite you to stand at this time and let's prepare our hearts as we get ready to worship. Today is the third message in a series on the Ten Commandments, and today we're thinking that God is the one and only true God. In fact, we can see Him in the world around us. His evidence is made known through the world that He created. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea.
be seated. We have just spent about a dozen minutes doing something we don't do throughout the rest of the week, and that is get to praise God together. Uh, I look forward to each Sunday morning when we do that, and I hope you do too. Uh, don't miss the first note. Uh, be, be ready to go to praise the Lord. And I don't know, Pastor John, about that first song, Open Up the Heavens. It is becoming one of my very favorite songs. And uh, just for what it says and for how it opens me up to worshiping the Lord. And Bob, that little lick that you do right before the end, can you do that for us again or do you need the music? I don't remember what I did. <laughs> Bob says he doesn't remember what he did. Uh, I'm getting to what, you, you can't do that? Okay, okay, I, try, I tried to get him to do it, but you'll have to come back for the next service in order to hear it, I guess. It's, uh, it's one of those, what do you call it, uh, a lick? Yeah. It's a lick, okay. <laughs> well, you know, folks, uh, among us, there are several who are here at, for the very first time at Calvary Church. You are our guests we welcome you. My name is Brad Mullen. I'm one of the pastors here. But on behalf of all of the pastors and staff and people of Calvary Church, welcome. You uh, have privileged us, really, to come and worship with us this morning. We'd like to meet you personally. We don't require it, uh, but we would encourage it. Uh, we have, after every service, what we call the welcome gathering. There's a room. If you walk out the lobby, turn to the right. It's by the east entrance. It's called the welcome gathering gathering room or place, and uh, Pastor Bo, uh, our senior pastor, another 
Church staff will be there just to say hello, 10 minutes of your time. Uh, we'd love to know who you are, how you got here, and if we could answer any questions, we'd be very happy to do it. You also might want to consider next week coming to another gathering we call Discover Calvary. And of course, if you're here, you've discovered it in a way, but if you want to discover Calvary in a deeper way and kind of know what we're about, uh, this is the place to come, 9.15, next Sunday morning in the chapel. Uh, even if you know Calvary Church well, because the church is alive and growing and developing, guaranteed, if you come, you'll learn something new about Calvary Church, what we're about and where we're going. So uh, you're welcome to that. Also, if you're going to be here after the second service or about 12.30, lunch is being served in the fellowship hall. We'd love to have you here for lunch. It's a time of fellowship. Last week, we broke all records, over 750 people. Can you believe it? Stayed for lunch. The poor kitchen crew was going crazy. But anyway, we were able to, to get everybody taken care of. Also, I want you to put on your calendar Wednesday, Wednesday evening, May the 4th, for all the people of Calvary Church who volunteer, and that's most of you, we want to say thank you. And this is a kind of semi-formal way that we can do it. Dessert, we're going to hear about stories of life change, things that are happening at Calvary Church that God is doing through you. So that's May the 4th, 7 uh, p.m. Please... Uh, Please be with us. And then, another thing to put on your calendar, Thursday evening, April the 28th, 7 p.m., the Barnstormers are having their opening game. And uh, Chubby Checker will be there. <laughs> you know who Chubby Checker is? Yeah, but the headliner for the evening, our King's Kids. Our King's kids are going to be singing God Bless America. So if you want to be there, third base line, support them uh, in that. Okay. Uh, I'm excited about the series that we're in. It, it, it's something that I believe God's going to use in the life, my life and the life of Calvary Church to move us closer to what it means to pursue life in Christ. Freedom rules. Let's pray now and ask God to use this series in our life to move us forward for his sake. Let's pray. Father, speak to us, we pray, in this series, Freedom Rules. Speak to us, and yes, convict us, and even warn us. Lead us to rely upon your grace in Christ to fulfill all that you've called us to be and to do. Oh Lord, hear our prayer, needy people who are bowed before you now, bound by sinful habits and selfish ambition, battered and bruised because we've wandered off the pathway of your protecting guidance. Convince us through the Holy Spirit that we can be free, and free from whatever sin that threatens to enslave us. Teach us what the Lord Jesus meant when he said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Lord, give us freedom in our work to labor for your glory and to seek your well done above all others. Give us freedom in our schoolwork so we can learn with you and for you. Give us freedom in our parenting to say with integrity that, Lord, our house is your home. Give us freedom in our spending and investing and giving as stewards and not owners of all that you give us. And give us freedom in our time management we want to live not as we so often do, as if you're far, far away, but as you promise that you will be with us always. And give us freedom in all our relationships so that it's less about us and more about our families and our friends, more about your people and your world. 
Thank you, Father, for your freedom rules. We will pay close attention this morning when Pastor Bo leads us to think about the dangers of idols in our lives. So teach us to know the truth that sets us free, the truth found in Christ alone. We worship him this morning, and it's in his dear name we pray. Amen. together now.
road again. Just can't wait to get on the road again. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. Across the desert, bad man. My name is Bo Eckert, and I'm actually old enough to remember that when you turned the radio station like that, that you just used to hear that little staticky in between, so somebody that probably uh, took you back a little bit, but I was proud of the fact that when the creative team put that together, I, was, I remember that. I remember turning the radio station, you get that static in between, and then you come across that new song, and uh, it's good stuff. So um, as you know, we are in this series called Freedom Rules, and doesn't that sound a little bit like a contradiction. How do rules bring about freedom? Well, when it comes to the rules of the road, we just saw a whole bunch of signs up on the screen in that roll-in video. The rules of the road don't restrict our freedom. They actually enhance it, correct? I counted uh, the number of signs from my house. It takes me about six minutes from my house to uh, to get from here to, to the church, and there was well over 50 signs on the road. Now, half of those are out here on the bridge, uh, but, but needless to say, um, it's amazing how many signs are there, not to restrict, but to enhance our freedom. And during this series, we're looking at the rules and the laws that God gives us and how we can understand how they enhance our freedom. Um, God keeping us and making us free to be who he has created us to be. So we are in Exodus chapter 20. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open there with me. It's found on page 61 if you want to open the Pew Bible uh, that's in front of you uh, and follow along. Uh, if you're on Twitter, we're using the hashtag Freedom Rules if you want to join in that conversation. As you're turning there, just one housekeeping item. Most weeks I get notes, sometimes handwritten, sometimes emails uh, from you all, from the people in the congregation, and you share stories, you share things related to the series. Uh, most of the time the notes are encouraging. Sometimes you write with a few suggestions, and, um, and, and I appreciate the notes. I, I try to get back and respond, even if it's just a brief thank you, uh, but just know even if I don't get back to you, I read everything that you send me, and I'm so appreciative. But this week I got a unique note. You see, most of the weeks I get notes from human beings. This week I received a note from a cat. <laughs> For those of you that were here last week, I used and talked about cat and dog theology to help us to understand the first commandment to understand the fact that we can view and understand our rightful place in God's story if we understand the way that cats and dogs view their owners. You see, a dog looks at his owner and says, you feed me, you pet me, you love me, you take care of me, therefore you must be God. But cat owners, you know that's a little bit different. You know that the cat says to his owner, you feed me, you love me, you take care of me, you do all these things for me, therefore I must be God. So there's a family in our church, the Landis family, and every week when they leave, they leave the radio on so that Stuart, their cat, can listen along to our Sunday morning services. So when I gave that illustration and I talked about the way that cats view the world, Stuart wrote me a note, and here's what Stuart had to say. Stewart said, thank you for publicly acknowledging me as the head of the Landis household. You are the best pastor I know. 
So that was a really encouraging, me and Stuart, I wasn't, not, I'm not necessarily a cat person, but that might change. Me and Stuart now, we've got a little connection going on. And the Landis family said they will continue to leave the radio on so that Stuart can listen along. I know that it's dangerous for me to share that because I'm sure that all of the animal kingdom is going to start sending things my way. So I look forward to, uh, to seeing the creativity that might come from that. We are at commandment number two in Exodus chapter 20. And by way of context, Exodus chapter 20, verse two, when God gave them the 10 commandments, he said this. He said, I am the Lord, your God. Not I am the Lord, the God, but I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of of slavery. You see, God God didn't come to his people and he didn't give them a path to follow and said, if you follow this path, then you'll be my people. He says, no, you're already my people. You're already in. The rules that I'm giving you are a confirmation of the relationship that we have, not a condition for the relationship. You see, there's this myth out there, and I still think it exists today, that there's a good God, and he throws out a few rules for us humans, and we kind of scramble around and try to follow the rules, and if we do, then we're getting good with him. I kind of view it like, you know, as a kid, I remember being taking part, I don't think we do this anymore because of allergies and the whole thing, but... When I was a kid, we used to have peanut scrambles. Remember doing a peanut scramble? You know, you throw the peanuts out in the yard and the kids run and they see how many peanuts. Sometimes I think that's how we view God, that God throws out these peanuts, that he throws out these rules and we run around and scurry around and try to see how many we can keep and how many we follow. And there's some rules that we don't like, so we just kind of ignore those. But the ones that we do like, we really try to follow those and we make sure that other people are following those rules as well. And, you know, we, we try to get in good with God by the rules that we keep. God says, no, you're already in with me. The rules are there to keep you free. The rules are there to keep you and make you who I have created you to be. So as we are looking, you know, the the rules were given in a context for them and and the question still is for us and we're actually gonna answer this over the next couple weeks and we've talked about a little bit. What do these 10 commandments, what do these rules have to do with me and with us? And as we're looking at these first couple commandments, it helps us to see who God is and we learn more, not only about God, but we learn more about ourselves as we look at the rules that he gives us. So he began last week with the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. I should be the one and only. I should be the first and foremost. I should be front and center. When it comes to our relationship with God, it is a one-way street. That's why we used the one-way sign last week. The people of Israel, when they were in Egypt, They had all kinds of different, the the, the Egyptians had all kinds of different roads, all kinds of different paths to different gods and, you know, and it was illustrated with the, the, you know, the sign that I put up last week with all these different ways to, to get to certain places. No, when it comes to God, when it comes to our loyalty to him, it's one way. God is our one and only, our first and foremost. God should be front and center in our life. Put God first. One way. That was commandment number one. Today, Commandment number two. It's a little bit longer if you look in your text. It's over the course of several verses, so we're gonna break it down in its part. But it begins and God says this, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or you shall not make an idol. You shall not get into idolatry. And as you read that on the screen, your first question might be, Well, does this mean that I'm not supposed to make an image that represents another God, a different God, like the Egyptians where we just came out of, or is God saying, don't make an image that represents me? 
And I think it's leaning towards the latter versus the former because if he was actually just saying, don't make a carved image that represents another God or don't have other gods that you bow down to, in a sense, he would have just been repeating himself from what he said in commandment number one. So there is a progression here, a a little bit of an extension of the first one, and I'm gonna talk about this in, in full. But here's why I think that's what he was saying. He first said, don't have other gods before me. Don't have other gods the way that other nations have other gods. But not only that, I don't want you to have anything that represents me as your God. You see, in that culture and in that context, the other pagan nations, with all the different gods they had, they made idols, they made images, they had pictures, they had statues that represented that God, but it wasn't just a representation of that God. It was as if the the God was present in that idol, so that when they were in the presence of that idol, they believed that they were in the presence of that God. And what they did with those idols that they made to represent those gods is, it was their way of controlling and manipulating the gods. You see, in an an idol worship context, they, they care for the idol. They take care of it, they feed it, they bathe it because they feel like by doing that, they're appeasing and taking care of the God so that they can get what they want. Making a carved image that represents a God was a way to make a God manageable. It was a way to manipulate that God. And God is coming to the children of Israel and said, not only should you have no other gods before me, you shouldn't make anything that represents me. You shouldn't manipulate me. You shouldn't try to make me manageable. So the image that goes with this, the sign that goes with this, is this danger construction area, keep out. I think that represents this commandment very well. We know where these signs are located. They're usually hanging on a fence right outside of a construction zone. And isn't there something in us, there's something that was in me as a kid, you go up to that fence and you kind of, you put your fingers through the fence and you look into that construction zone and you say, I would just love to get in there and play. I would just love to get in there and, and play on that big construction equipment. When I was a kid, I had one of those yellow Tonka, um, dump trucks, they don't make them like that anymore. I love that truck. And then you'd go to the construction zone and you'd see the real version of it. And you say, I just wanna get in there and, and mess around and hammer things and hit things and you know, knock things down and you know, play on the equipment. And, 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 and it's as if God is saying, look, there's something in us that wants to construct things that makes God manageable so that we can control God, so that we can manipulate God. There's something in us that leans and wants the physical to really be a representation of the invisible God. And God said, no, 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 don't do that. Beware, there's danger of going to that construction zone. Don't construct anything that's going to represent me. For them, for, for, for their mentality, when the Israelites received this, this warning of you shall not make for yourself the carved image, this would have been odd for them because that's all they understood. When you had a God, you had an image or an idol that represented that God. So it's almost ironic that when God is giving the law when God is creating this new culture for his people that he brought up out of the land of Egypt, when he is giving Moses that law up on Mount Sinai, what is one of the most famous stories in all of Exodus that the people of Israel are doing while Moses is up there getting the law? They're making for themselves a carved image. Moses has gone up and down the mountain a few times and he comes down and he you know, had given the, the commandments to the people and they agreed that they were gonna do it. Moses goes back up on the mountain, he's getting more laws. 
but he's kind of taking his time up there on the mountain. God and him are having some you know, time together. And in Exodus chapter 32, what do the people say? When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and they said to him, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know, we do not know what has become of him. He's taken too long up there on the mountain. It's as if they're saying, this is my interpretation, so you can disagree with me, it's fine. It's as if they viewed Moses as their liaison between God. He was their representative to God. He, he's the one that led them by God's hand, bringing them out of Egypt. But now Moses has been gone for a while, and their mentality continues to be, we need someone that represents our God. Moses played that role and fulfilled that role, but we don't know what happened to him. So Aaron, we need somebody new or something new that's going to represent our God. So Aaron says, okay, give me all your gold, and he melts it down, and he makes for them a golden calf. And he says in verse 4, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And I know that we don't have time to get into the, the depths of this, but were they saying that they wanted new and different gods to worship because Moses and Yahweh, we don't know what happened to them. Or are they saying, we just need something new that represents Yahweh, that represents the one that brings, brought us out of Egypt? I actually believe it's the latter. I actually believe that they still recognize that Yahweh is the one that brought them out, but we just need something new to represent that God. We need an image of that God. How can we worship God if we don't have an image of that God? And we could argue and we could go back and forth on that, but look what Aaron says in verse five. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. He built an altar right in front of the golden calf. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to other gods? No, no. Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. It's, that's the reason I believe that they viewed the golden calf as a representation of God, of Yahweh, who brought them out of Egypt. So what begins to happen with them? There begins this mixing of their worship. Well, yeah, Yahweh is the one that brought us out of Egypt, but we need this golden calf to, to, to be the representation and the image and the idol that represents that God. And I think that's in you, and I think that's in me as well. That God is still there. God is still a part of our life, but sometimes there's other things that can creep in that can become just as important, if not more important, than him. And God says, no, 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 no. That's not the way that it should work. I am unrepresentable. There's nothing that you can make that's going to accurately represent me. How can you take something from creation, something from the creation that I have made, and try to represent me. So back to the commandment. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. Don't try to represent me by the moon or the stars or the sun or that is in the earth beneath. Don't make an animal like a golden calf that you think somehow represents me or anything that's in the water under the earth. No fish, no crocodiles. This is what the other countries did. This is how they represented their God. Don't try to bring me down to size. Whatever you try to create, I'm bigger than that. I'm more majestic than that. I have revealed myself to you in the mighty deeds that I've done. I have revealed myself to you in the words and the laws that I've given and it hasn't happened yet, but God is going to reveal himself by describing his character to them. And we're not supposed to try to represent that in an image or an idol. Exodus 34, verse six. Look how God reveals himself by his character. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, 
slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. God reveals himself by his character and he says, as I've revealed myself to you, that's how you should worship me. Two verses later, Moses' response to God revealing himself with all these words was that he quickly bowed his head towards the earth and he worshiped. The more that we know about God, the more that we know about who he is, the more accurately we can worship him. They felt that they needed an idol in order to represent God, and then they, in a sense, worship that idol, thinking that they're worshiping God. No, the more we get to know God, the more we can accurately worship him, not just in the songs that we sing, but in the life that we live. That's why Jesus in the New Testament says that we worship in spirit and in what? Truth. When we understand who God is, we can more accurately worship him and our lives reflect who he is and who he wants us to be. The more we know, the more we can worship him in all of our life. So what does this look like for you and me? What is the temptation for you and for me? The temptation is not to I don't think it's to make a statue that somehow represents God the way that they were tempted to do. But I think the temptation becomes, the temptation is still there when we try to manipulate God, when we try to make God manageable, when we get more concerned about the means to an end than the end in itself. Here's what I mean by that. There are wonderful things that we have that contribute to helping us to better worship God. And those, some of those things very much include images, the image of the cross, the image of the communion elements, the bread and the, and the cup and the, and the juice that's in the cup. Those are physical, tangible images that point us to, to, to know more about God and those can become very helpful. But when the tangible things that are a means to an end become more important than God himself, then we've made them an idol. I'm not meddling here. I just want you to think about this a little bit deeper. For some of us, the setting for worship is very important. And there's nothing wrong with that unless the setting becomes an idol. For some of us, the songs that we sing in order to worship God are very important unless they become something that we feel that we need, we need a certain style, we need a certain song in order to worship him, then the song or the style becomes an idol. Artwork can be a wonderful way to help point us to God and think about God and using the gifts that he has and, and the images, and, oh, it's so beautiful and look how that, but if the artwork that we create, if the means to an end becomes more important, then those things become idols. There's lots of different ways that we could define idolatry. Let me just give you a couple. And you might, say, you might send me 18 more this week and that's fine. There's lots of ways that idolatry can be identified. These were two definitions that were helpful to me. This first definition is by Robertson McQuilkin and he says this. When you place ultimate value on what is finite... I think that's a good definition of idolatry because it's not saying that the things that are finite aren't important. There's many things that, that, that we experience and many things that we see that are very important and help us in our worship of God. But when we place ultimate value on something that is finite, that's when it becomes idolatry. Tim Keller uses that same word ultimate when he defines idolatry. He says this, anything more important to you than God that's a simple definition of idolatry. Anything that becomes more important to you than God. Does that mean that there can't be other important things in our lives? No, absolutely not. There should be many important things in our lives. When good things become ultimate things, that's when they become 
idolatry. And that is also very helpful because some people say, oh, I wanna get rid of everything in my life so that God can be first and foremost. No, no, as long as you keep God first and foremost, those other things have their rightful place. It's when good things, like our job, like our family, like our preferred style of worship, um, like the way that um, you know, our, our habits, you know, whatever they might be, when good things in life when they become ultimate things, that's when it becomes idolatry. So what is ultimate? I think that's a good word to think about. What is ultimate in our lives? Is it a statue that we have on the mantle at home? No, probably not. But let me just give you a couple examples of things that could become ultimate and therefore could become idolatry. I can't believe that I'm gonna do this, but later in the year, I'm actually gonna preach some messages here at Calvary Church on the political process in our country because it's an election year. I know I'm wading into some dangerous territory when we do that, but because of it being an election year, we need to engage with that. For some of us, our political views might become ultimate in our lives and therefore could become an idol. For others, sometimes a mindset, the, our worldview, the way that we think, sometimes we can elevate intellectualism. Sometimes our doctrinal rigidity, sometimes our theological precision can become so important to us that it actually becomes an idol. Do you know, sometimes our attitudes can actually become an idol. Let me just give you just one random example. All of us have been hurt by someone or something in life. Somebody has hurt us, somebody has let us down. And when we become hurt, that hurt can lead to anger and it can lead to bitterness. Idolatry is when we become, worship is when we become like the choices that we make. So if we're not careful, our attitude of bitterness can actually become an idol in our life. And we justify it away and we say, well, you don't know what they did to me. You don't understand the way that they've treated me. But if we allow those things to fester in our lives, we are choosing to be angry, we're choosing to be bitter, And therefore, we become like our choices. And God knows this. God knows that our hearts, and and we, we will become like what we choose to follow. And if we're making choices in our life to be bitter, it can become an idol. So God goes on and he talks and he fleshes this out a little bit more in verse five. He says this. He says, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. What does it mean that God is jealous? You see, we often view jealousy as a negative characteristic. Does this mean that God is insecure? Does this mean that God is jealous for me? This means that God is jealous for his rightful place in our lives. This means that God is jealous for the glory of his own name. And he understands that when we make an idol, he understands that when something else becomes ultimate in our lives, he has lost his rightful place and therefore becomes jealous. As every illustration that you know breaks down, let me share one that I think can be helpful even though I know it breaks down at some point. Many, many years ago, I spent about six months on the mission field in South Central Africa in the country of Malawi. And the place that I stayed was fairly flat and there was no um, electricity in the area. So... At night, I had the experience of being able to see stars on the horizon. 
If you've ever been in a place that you can, that's flat enough that you can see stars on the horizon, it's a pretty cool experience. So as the, as the moon would go through its cycle, its monthly cycle, it was interesting the way that the atmosphere changed at night based on where the moon was. When the moon was not out, when the moon was not bright, when the moon was not shining, you needed a flashlight of some sort because you couldn't make your way around at night because it was just so dark. But when there was a full moon and the moon was shining bright, we would literally go outside at nighttime and we could have a game of catch. We could throw football, we could throw baseball, we could throw things back and forth and see fine because of how bright the moon was. When we talk about the brightness of the moon, do you think that the sun gets a little jealous? Because even though we talk about the moon being bright and the moon shining, we all know that the moon has no light of its own. It is a reflector. It is a mirror reflecting and shining the light of the sun. I looked it up and, and here's what one astronomer said. As you know, when you see the light of the moon, you're actually seeing the reflected light from the sun. It's bouncing off the moon, which acts like a mirror, a really terrible mirror. When astronauts walked on the surface of the moon, they reported that it was dark gray, the color of pavement. Because of its dark color and bumpy surface, it only reflects about 12% of the light that hits it. The moon reflects the light poorly. In the same way, that's what human beings are to be and are to do. We are mirroring or imaging creatures. And when God made us, when we had not yet sinned, we were perfect reflectors of him, perfect reflectors of his glory. That's who you and I were created to be. So it's not surprising that when Paul describes the fallenness and the sinfulness of man, he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We become poor reflectors of him. But we're still created in his image and it's still his desire that we would reflect him, reflect his glory out into the world. That should be our mentality. This is why God says, don't create a carved image, don't make an idol, because you and I are supposed to be the image bearers of God. Don't try to make something else that represents me. I've already made something that's supposed to represent me, and that's human beings. And the perfect image bearer of God, the perfect reflector of God, is the Lord Jesus Christ. So as Jesus is doing work in our lives, what is he trying to do in us? Some of us think that God is just trying to make us a better version of ourselves. That's not true. God is trying to restore what you were created to be, a mirror, a reflector, an image bearer of God. This is the language that the New Testament authors use. Paul in Romans chapter eight, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to a better version of yourself. No, conformed to the image of his son. Jesus is the perfect image of God and that's what he's conforming us to be. 2 Corinthians chapter three, and we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord. Do you know what that word beholding literally means? It means to mirror or to reflect the glory of the Lord and being transformed into the same image, the image of God from one degree of glory to another. That's who you and I are to be. We are to reflect him. This is what's happening when a human being is in perfect alignment. We're not becoming a better version of ourselves. We're becoming more and more like Jesus. 
And here's the thing that's so amazing about this. All of us are unique in our own ways. And God doesn't want that uniqueness of your gifts and your talents and your personality to go away. But in the uniqueness of all of us, the one thing that we should have in common is that we should be being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. It's very similar to the cars that we drive. Different makes, different models, different colors, different sizes all look a little bit different. But the desire is for that car to be going down the road to be in perfect alignment, even though they look a little bit different. Different makes, different models, perfectly aligned to reflect the glory of God. That's why we're not supposed to make a carved image because that's your job and that's my job. If you are honest with yourself, some of you this morning, what is an idol in your life is a better version of you. What you're worshiping is a better version of you. You beat yourself up when you fall short because you're just trying to be a better version of you. When we get to the place that we understand that the work that God is doing in us and that Christ is doing in us is trying to conform us to the image of his son, it frees us up from just trying to be a good person. And we read God's word and we open it and we see the spirit at work through God's word conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. Free yourself from that idol of just trying to be a better version of you. Some of us need to be freed from the idol of trying to be someone else. We're a Toyota Camry, but we really wish we were a Honda Accord. And you wish that you were somebody else. You wish you had different gifts. You wish you could be more like them. No, understand that God has created and made you unique just as you are. Stop trying to become like somebody else and fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who's trying to conform you into his image. That's why we're pursuing life in Christ. God gives a stern warning in verse five. He says, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord, I'm a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. Now that's a verse that we could spend lots of time unpacking. And it begs the question of what does it mean by multi-generational punishment? And I don't have time to unpack that this morning. And I'm not even sure what all I would say about multi-generational punishment. But I do understand multi-generational consequences. And so do you. Some of your parents, some of your grandparents have made choices that have directly impacted you both positively and negatively. Some of you look to your heritage of parents and grandparents and you're so thankful for the godly legacy that's been passed down to you and now the job is with you to continue to pass that to the next generation. But there's others of you, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents have made poor choices and they have impacted you and now instead of blaming them and pointing to them and say, I don't have a choice, I'm just a victim, does that string, do those consequences need to end with you? And as God becomes first and foremost in front and center and you make different choices in your life, what you pass on to the next generation becomes very, very different. God contrasts that in verse six as he reveals his heart, but he's showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me. The pagans manipulate God to get what they want. They manage, they control. God wants a relationship with you. God wants you to experience the benefits of being, of walking with him. The benefits of what's gonna happen as he's conforming you into the image of his son. And so what do we pass on to the next generation? Is it following God and putting God first and foremost? 
Or is it letting those things drift away and then not knowing what the consequences might be? These first two commandments, for them then and for us today, become very foundational. You shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Don't manipulate. Don't try to control. Don't try to manage God by putting him on a shelf, by putting him on a day. Sometimes we do that. Well, I worship God on Sunday when I go to church, but then the rest of the week, I kind of do how I want. That's an idol, trying to manage and manipulate God. Say, no, we're going to put God first, and we're going to worship God only. So I finish with this challenge. We will become like what we set our eyes on. Upon. Our hearts will follow what our eyes are set upon. And God is saying, when I am first and foremost and front and center, when you're worshiping me only, and you're not worshiping the means to an end, you haven't created or carved anything that you're going to put in front of me, when your eyes are on me, you're going to become more like me. When our eyes go on other things, when our eyes are on our own bitterness, we'll become more bitter. When our eyes are on someone else that we wish we could become like, we're gonna become more and more like them. God says, no, set your eyes on me, your heart will then follow, and everything else in life finds its rightful place when we put God first and we worship God only. Let me pray for you this morning. Father, thank you for these foundational commandments in our lives. Thank you for how critical it is for us to come to the place where we've made a choice and a decision about who we're going to worship or what we're going to worship and who or what is going to be first and foremost in our lives. Father, it's possible that we've set our eyes on other things. The children of Israel felt that they needed something else to set their eyes upon, that golden calf, to to picture you, to represent you. And Father, whether it's a, a setting or an atmosphere or a style or an image, there's things that we bring into our lives that We try to control and manipulate you to get what we want. So, Father, it's foundational, but it's so critical that we come to the place where our eyes are fixed and focused on you. Would you keep our eyes on you first so that then our hearts can be on you as well? Thank you for this challenge. Thank you for how your word brings us back to that place where we need that realignment in our lives. And as we sing this song, as we lift this up to you now, may you do that work in our lives to bring about that realignment that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to stand and let's sing this song as we close today. Yeah.
sacred refuge is your name. Your kingdom is unshakable. so appropriate that the last word of that song is freedom. When our hearts, when our eyes are set on him and him alone, we experience the freedom that he has designed and created us to be. Reminder of the welcome gathering. If you're new, I'd love to connect with you out the door down to the right. There's a big sign there. I'd love to be able to just no more than 10 minutes of your time connect with you there. If you're staying through the next hour, lunch is served today. We look forward to our time together with you there and uh, look forward to seeing you back next week for commandment number three. Have a great, great day. God bless you all.
of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise the mount i'm fixed upon it mount of thy redeeming pleasure safely to arrive at home Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fall of God he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood precious blood From sinning, I shall see thy lovely face, clothed then in blood washed linen. How I'll sing thy sovereign grace. Come, my Lord, no longer tarry, take my ransom soul away. Send thy name. Now to carry me to realms of endless day Oh, to grace, how great a debtor Daily I am constrained to be Let thy goodness, like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to Thee Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it Seal it for Thy courts above Here's my heart, oh Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts
belong with